Thank you, Sue, and welcome to everyone from around the world, uh, depending upon where you are. It may be good evening or good morning or good afternoon, and um, most importantly, Happy New Year. My name is Jeff Hall. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Coaching, as Sue said, and I am thrilled to be here for our kickoff webinar in 2023 and super excited to have one of our dear friends at the Institute of Coaching, a thought leader that we've had speak at our conference, we've had webinars with her in the past, and we always learn a great deal from Jennifer Brown when she comes and speaks to us about her latest thinking around inclusion and diversity. Today, Jennifer will speak to us about how to be, how to coach an inclusive leader, and if you're not familiar with her background, let me just take a minute to introduce her to you. So Jennifer, as I said, is a dear friend of the Institute, but she's much more than that. She's an award-winning entrepreneur, a speaker, an author, diverse, diversity and inclusion expert, and the founder and CEO of Jennifer Brown Consulting, a certified women and LGBT-owned firm based out of New York. She and her team designed and execute inclusion strategies that have been implemented by some of the world's biggest companies and nonprofits all over the world. She's also the best-selling author of two books, Inclusion, Diversity, The New Workplace, and The Will to Change, and How to Be an Inclusive Leader, Your Role in Creating Cultures of Belonging Where Everyone Can Thrive which just came out in its second edition due to its success. So we want to congratulate her on that and also point to her amazing podcast. And I've been fortunate to be a guest with her on her podcast called The Will to Change, which is downloaded by nearly 15,000 listeners a month. So we are super excited to have Jennifer with us today as our kickoff for 2023 to talk to us with really practical strategies and tips for coaches around a topic that is near and dear to my heart and to hers. How do we create a more inclusive workplace and develop and coach inclusive leaders in today's world? So I want to welcome you again from all over the world. I know there's a large group joining us today, so please take a minute and say hello from wherever you are. We love to see folks coming in from all over the place. And um, I'll take a look at the chat and we'll see. We've got folks coming. Oh my God, the very first thing I saw, Jennifer, is Mexico, Switzerland, <laughs> Barcelona, Washington, Austin. It's wow. flying by. So welcome everyone. I will ask you um, to do me one favor, and I know it's not easy to control, but try to put your questions as they come into your head into the Q&A box and obviously keep the dialogue alive in the chat box so that Jennifer and I can, when we get to our Q&A section um, in a little while, we'll be able to pull out as many of the great questions as we can during the time we have together. And with that, I wanna say hello, Jennifer, dear friend, so happy to have you back and turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. What a lovely introduction. Hello, uh, community of coaches, some of my favorite people. Um, in the world and the, some of the most important people in terms of growing inclusive leaders um, with those in those that we work with and support and believe in. So I always get ex especially excited uh, speaking to an audience like this uh, because I so much identify with uh, the work you do. I do that work. Um, I'm very passionate about growing leaders that I support and um, and really puzzling through what causes us to change and evolve. You know, what causes a human to change and evolve and what and and how do we how do we as the coaches continue to evolve ourselves as we are also enabling the evolution of others? That's fundamentally the question that I sit with in this kind of community. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to share some concepts with you today and um, elaborate on them through that lens because it's so fascinating and so important. And I, I view all of you just so you know, I know you know this, but you are an incredible um, a hub, if you will, that that whose light extends to so many different leaders. And 
Um, that's to me the exponential impact that you all can have in the work that you do and you impacting a leader that then impacts thousands or tens of thousands or Im has impact ripple effects around the world. Um, when you coach leaders from all over the world, um, you are literally lifting up this conversation. You are literally accelerating uh, us towards the goal of equity and equality, those goals of inclusiveness that we all, uh, uh, so many of us, and I hope I would assume most of us here really care about. So um, if you uh, please use the Q&A box just to reiterate what Jeff said for your questions, and then let's use the chat box for comments and um, plus ones and, you know, anything that you'd like to share also about your own experience vis-a-vis -vis the concepts that I'll be talking about. I always love those kinds of shares because you aren't alone and you saying, wow, this really resonates for me. This is what happens for me. This is how it feels, how it lands. Uh, we love that. And, and I think that's so helpful to hear that A, we're not alone and B, for me to see that so I can weigh in on it too. All right. So, I believe that you know everyone knows something about diversity. Um, everyone has a diversity story, multiple stories. Um, true for me as well. Um, some of it, it might be visible and a lot of it is invisible. And it's one of the con key concepts we'll get into around uh, visible and invisible diversities. Um, much of which we can't see and much of which matters more than ever in coming into 2023. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a bit. But quickly, my personal story, um, I came to New York City to be an opera singer in my late 20s and uh, trained really hard, got my master's in vocal performance, wanted to be on the Broadway stage. But unfortunately, I, I injured my voice. And some of you who know me know this story. I've told it on the TED stage, but um, I literally couldn't sing really at all. Um, and I had to get it repaired. And this happened several times. It sort of was chronic. And I ended up having to leave performing because I, I just knew the writing was on the wall that my instrument just wouldn't have the stamina to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And, you know, when I decided to leave after investing so many years of my life and, and feeling that uh, singing in particular was the only means I would ever have to be able to express myself and my truth and, and be of service and give my gifts, um, that wouldn't be true, thankfully, um, but you do feel that these things are catastrophic in our lives, and, and I felt I would, I would lose my voice, metaphorically and literally. But, um, but then what would happen would be that performers are incredibly agile people, and several performer friends said, you know, why don't you look into training and development? And I didn't know what that field was at the time. I scarcely knew the business world as, an, as a performing artist. But I would subsequently follow the breadcrumbs left for me by mentors and enroll and get another master's degree in human resources and organizational change and really discover this whole world and this field that I, that I love now and feels deeply, deeply true for me and very alive for me, which is how do humans thrive in a system and, and who's thriving and who's not thriving and why. Um, and so I would subsequently found Jennifer Brown Consulting almost 20 years ago and grow and work with some of the leading companies in the world. And uh, happy to say that I get to work across so many different industries now, really studying and our team, my team and I look at <clears throat> what's getting in the way of thriving and belonging in the workplace. And um, how can we enable us all to feel welcomed, valued, respected, and heard? Because that's that foundational place from which we do all of our best work. If we have a shaky foundation, there's no way that we can be creative and build trust and, and, and really um, feel psychological safety in order to um, be our most, bring our biggest contributions to, and our purpose to what we do. So, um, so that's what we get to do every day. And it's such a blessing, but you know, I, this work is very personal for me too, because so I, I started Jennifer Brown Consulting. We pivoted into diversity, equity, and inclusion about 15 years ago, but I have been, you know, struggling with my own stories also because I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community. So, you know, we were, we as a community were closeted uh, in the nineties and the aughts and the teens. And, you know, becoming a woman owned and LGBT owned and certified company at Jennifer Brown Consulting gave me kind of a legitimacy, if you will, like a credibility to stand on. But it doesn't mean that I don't feel the stigma 
still less now, but now as a teacher, you know, I've wrestled with that for many, many years. And now I'm just acutely aware of the ways in which even I sort of have to be extra, or think I have to be extra vigilant around my own psychological safety, my own, the biases that, that may be coming at me if I disclose who I am. And uh, so I was closeted for many years in different roles that I had um, and sort of, you know, worked my way out of the closet, certainly. But what I really, what really resonated that I found about six years ago was Kenji Yoshino's work on covering. He has a beautiful book called Covering, which I would recommend all of you read. Um, he's a professor at NYU um, in the law school now, a constitutional law professor. But he defines this term, he did some research with Deloitte um, as downplaying and minimizing a known stigmatized identity. And it's, it's, it's perhaps more of a subtle thing than the closet. And it really resonated with me because technically I was out, technically. But we can make all kinds of small decisions, daily micro decisions where we play small, where we don't disclose, where we kind of depersonalize, we sanitize who we are. We make many decisions over the course of a day about disclosure and about authenticity. And covering is something I still I still wrestle with in the room I'm in. If I look around, I don't see anyone that maybe I think gets it, right? I'm having my own biases about who I'm seeing, which is a very limited amount of data. Um, and I'm also um, anticipating being stereotyped. And so I'm thinking, well, how do I give myself the biggest fighting chance to be taken seriously and have the authority that I want? And, you know, I think I reflect on this and, you know, I've been in the inclusion space and I have four books on it. And, you know, I am the paid expert that's in the room. And yet, to have my identity still occur to me, my whether it's my gender, my my sexual orientation, which is more less visible than my gender identity, which is by the way my pronouns are she her, so I identify as a cisgender woman. Um, but and my you know my skin color, uh, my ability, or you know I might have hidden disabilities. So I'm always like, hmm, you know, I wonder. Given what I know, I wonder you know, how I can navigate. And to me, covering is exhausting and it's being done every single day on a variety of topics. And it, it has, has kind of become this core of, of how I approach this topic, because it's something that we as coaches, we need to keep in mind for our own journey, you know, exploring our own diversity stories, you know, where am I bargaining with who I am and where am I, where am I spending invaluable energy anticipating, managing for potential stereotyping, biasing, um, exclusion, right? And that may be happening in your coaching relationships, by the way. So I think that's where it gets really interesting, sort of feeling most aligned and authentic and honoring of who we are in the coaching context, but also the covering that may be going on and is likely going on in the people that we coach, right? And then the people they manage and helping that leader think about this, because sometimes I would imagine a lot of you coach leaders who are of certain identities that have put them in the majority in leadership, you know, historically. And so this concept of covering is something that they may not A, relate to themselves, but B, they, might, they, may, they may not think is real. And so, you know, the last slide we showed, you know, these, these different identity groups who are like, oh, you know, there's higher degrees of daily covering experienced by those of us that are less common in the workplace, right? Less represented um, because for lots of reasons, you know, we don't feel as psychologically safe as others might feel. But, you know, this slide shows, you know, a room full of leaders from, you know, hundred years ago, but honestly, you know, still fairly similar to leadership ranks these days. Uh, sadly, that leadership really doesn't look like the world that we live in. And that's the work that we really need to do. But um, in a room like this, I think about, and I work on my covering behaviors and I challenge myself to get comfortable being uncomfortable and not assume that my credibility is going to be questioned because of the identities I carry that have historically caused that. But I also really love the opportunity to see a room like this and say, there is so little I know about who is around this table. Um, and if we double click on this, um, I've, I've, um, the covering research includes straight white men. 
um, in addition to all these other identities. And, and this is important for all of us because as I, as I say, I, I'm guessing, and I'm not sure this is accurate, but the, the, a fair number of you coach leaders in this that appear to be in part of this demographic. But what's fascinating about invisible diversity dimensions is there's so much going on for everyone. We have no idea. And we've, we've kind of narrowly defined diversity as really race and gender, historically. That's what we've measured. That's what is easy to measure. Um, that might be what we've built performance metrics around. And we've probably focused on representation. That's the D in diversity. It's the who. But really, how have we measured inclusiveness, which is really more of a behavior, it's the how. Um, so, you know, when you think about roomfuls of people and we make assumptions about how people identify, I think it's so important to check our own biases about who's, you know, who we're looking at and all the invisible diversity dimensions that are likely um, dynamic, powerful dynamics that are being experienced by people, but that for many reasons have not been voiced or articulated or actually defined as part of how we talk about diversity. Um, so I think of it like an iceberg. I think of, you know, what's above and below the waterline. And um, it's, a, I, it's such a powerful image to remember that 10% is visible and 90% is not. And yet that 90% that's under the waterline is the piece that is, is so consequential. You know, I won't say necessarily dangerous. Uh, you have to know that it's there. And yet I, I don't think we have known that it is there. I don't think we've named all of the things that are stigmatized, right? That are that are that they're that that within which bias lives and exists, whether that's our parenting status or our you know decision making styles, our thinking styles, our neurodiversity, um, our true gender identity. Um, our, you know, health and issues pertaining to that, our trauma and grief, you know, coming through the last couple of years, our mental health challenges in ourselves and also in loved ones and family and team members. So um, I just don't think that the workplace has been a place that has felt safe enough for us to collectively lower our waterline on the iceberg and bring things, our truths above that waterline and to see those things be acknowledged, welcomed, celebrated as the sort of fodder for innovation that they are. They're the fodder of belonging. But we are having a very, I think, um, single dimensional conversation. And then when we look above the waterline in an organization, we see who's being promoted, who's being celebrated, who's at the top. And we sort of, that is normed through the organization. And a lot of what is under the waterline is not normed. It's not even understood it's to exist. And it's not even quantified in terms of how widespread it might be. And so when we look at things like, you know, parenting and, and mental health, those stretch across all different identity groups, for example, but are experienced intersectionally in each group, meaning mental health, there are cultural lenses on mental health, for example, that make them more or less okay to talk about or more or less stigmatized to seek help around, just to pick one dimension. So, you know, what's important for a leader who maybe you may be coaching, who may be relatively more comfortable in a certain environment, is I always point out, um, the workplace was built by and for certain groups of people to work for those people, to feel um, that it is comfortable for them, given the support networks they have, you know, given the number of people that look like them, like given the, the, the sort of primary nature of the, the, the norms of that culture, right? And I could even just say male, female, and I could say there's gender differences, you know, and, and that permeates organizations. I could say there are, there are generations that have a dominant voice in organizations and others that need to be heard more. Uh, and then it just goes on from there in terms of differences. So what we're really in the midst of is an opportunity that we've had, you know, with the murder of George Floyd and the pandemic that happened, you know, scarce three months before that. And then the sort of opening 
of this truthful conversation that we've been having and trying to keep that door open to continue to agitate for change, continue to um, have a truthful conversation about what's really going on for people so that we can keep them, enable them to thrive, support them adequately, and elevate them in their fullness to ideally positions of full contribution, full thriving, and seeking belonging for all. And this, this requires a huge change in the workplace because the workplace wasn't built by and for and to work for all of us. It just wasn't built by a diverse group of architects. So this is the work ahead. And um, if this, any of this is helpful as you're thinking, you're probably wearing two hats. You know, you're thinking about yourself and your own growth and your own iceberg. And then you're probably thinking about the people you support to say, where are they in their learning journey about their own iceberg, about their own identities and their own covering behaviors? And I might even argue that going back to remembering that slide of, of what looked like a table full of white guys, there are many covering behaviors to even confirm conform to what's expected of even white male leaders. So this is not just a message for people who don't identify as part of that group. This is a message that includes all, which is to say the workplace has been normed in this extremely narrow, confining way for all of us. And many of us, most of us don't fit in that. And that's the work that we need to do ahead. So um, so then from here, you know, I, I think the next logical step is so, you know, what are the puzzle pieces that make me who I am? And intersectionality simply defined is that I'm more than one identity. And for me, my intersectionality may be uh, my, you know, being female identified in a male dominated, traditionally male dominated environment, also maybe being LGBTQ plus and being in that community. And then there's many other ways. But I also have, I happen to have many identities of privilege in a given, in many of the systems of the world um, because of my socioeconomic background, because of my family, because of the opportunities I've had, because of the color of my skin, because of the expression of my gender, you know, it goes on and on. So when I think about myself as these combination of puzzle pieces, it, it takes Kimberly Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality. Um, and it sort of broadens it and it, to me begs the question sort of what are the ingredients of each of us and 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 what do we what does each ingredient enable us to do and and what do we need to feel that each ingredient that's so important to who we are is supported and seen and celebrated and hopefully utilized because i i believe that we're never given anything in our life whether we are born with it or acquire it we're never given it for an ac as as accidental it's something that is given you know to be utilized and there's someone that needs to see me in all of the combination of my puzzle pieces um, needs to see that piece that i'm scared to disclose that piece that i that takes risk to be authentic around you know to shine that light on their own experience including the experiences of privilege so um a little bit more on that on the next slide um privilege is, is coming up a lot for me lots of questions about it how do i coach how do i deal with my own how do i speak about it and then how do i coach leaders to speak about it um, I, I, I would recommend, it, it's been a very fraught topic. So you may, if you ever broach this and you probably have, it, you can feel people recoiling, you can feel the fear. Um, when you have benefited from a system that was built with you in mind, um, you may feel an accountability that, you know, that wasn't necessarily your direct doing, but it was that you, a recognition to, to acknowledge that you have had the wind at your back in certain respects in the world. There are certain things that you haven't had to cope with. Um, and so I just came up with some of these thought bubbles or things that um, I, I'm trying to take privilege necessarily out of those people have it and all of us don't bucket. It's not a binary. We each carry a kind of privilege or many privileges if we really stop to think about what are the tailwinds that are speeding us along in life that are actually headwinds for other people? And really think more broadly about um, beyond identity privilege and thinking about positional privilege, thinking about uh, the people I know, my, my social and professional capital. You know, to me, privilege means 
you know, power in a way, but it's not just power because of where I sit in the system, you know, and how that system regards me, but it's also the power to utilize and wield what I have access to. And um, I think that a lot of us can find something um, in that, even in that iceberg, for example, where that's not something I struggle with. So I am actually, that's something that I don't put energy towards. That's something that I don't uh, feel the need to conceal or is dangerous for me to share. You know, that to me is a privilege. So it's a new way of thinking about it. And I think for your leaders, my recommendation would be is to identify some of these things and ask a leader who might be feeling badly about who they are and, and afraid to articulate this to at the very least have an open conversation to say, so how are you utilizing what you have access to to enable the goals of the organization or your personal goals to be involved in more equity work? Like, what are you putting in play? I wake up every day and say to myself, you know, I, I need others to be activating their privileges uh, for and alongside me as somebody that has perhaps struggled from a marginalized place to find a voice. But I also know these days that I have a more nuanced understanding of how I need to be giving and what I can be giving and am I doing enough and I don't, I don't believe that a lot of us are doing everything that we can. And, and what's going to be beautiful about this, if we can kind of galvanize this effort, is that it activates so many more people. It, it sort of many hands make lighter work. Because what we've seen over the last couple of years is a few of us that are in the marginalized identity sort of pushing for change, it's a big heavy boulder. And it's very few of us pushing up a hill. But what if there were a poll? What if there were more involvement? Or what if there were more investment? What if, what if there were more contribution from these places of, here's what I have that I might take for granted, that I've enjoyed, that I've benefited from, that I can actually share? Doesn't mean you need to give it up. There's more than enough to go around, but it can be actively, proactively shared. So I prefer that definition of privilege. I, I hope it's helpful for all of you. Um, sometimes people's eyes glaze over because there's still so much trauma around the word that people can't even hear another way to look at it. And I understand that that's real. And that's unfortunately what the conversation has been. And I, I don't, I don't agree with it um, because I believe that there's, there's so much each of us, there are ways that each of us, no matter how much, how we identify have really been benefited from certain systems. So <clears throat> this is my last piece, our inclusive leader continuum in the, um, Jeff, thank you for mentioning the second edition of how to be an inclusive leader just came out in October. And I kept the model. And to me, I, I like meeting learners where they're at. I think it's so important for all of us to say, here's where I'm at. Here's what I need to learn more about. And, um, and here's then the right next step for me, for where I am. I would give you all two hats again to wear as we go through this. You have your own learning hat and your own learning journey. And then you're, you are going through that at the same time as you're supporting leaders to go through their journey. So you're sort of diagnosing yourself and you're also helping others to figure out like where they are so that you both can take the right next steps. And maybe something to think about is how do you, where are there points of collaboration and honesty about that in your coaching relationships? Um, so I chose four phases, typical model, right? I, I like the four phases and let me go through each one of these and you could think about like, where, where do you sit? And then where do some of the leaders sit that you work with? So the first phase on the left side is unaware. Um, this is, I, you know, this is somebody else's problem. I'm not diverse, which by the way, please like try to nip that one in the bud. <laughs> There's not diverse people and not diverse people. Um, it could be, I don't see color which is another thing it's important for us to sort of nip in the bud and say, you know, not seeing color is actually, is, is felt like an erasure of differences that really do make a difference. They matter and they don't always matter in positive ways. So let's not say I don't see color anymore. Let's, let's say I see that I've learned about it. I've educated myself. I am not okay with what happens around differences, you know, and here's, here's what my commitment is. Um, but anyway, people in unaware can be um, asleep, apathetic, um, resistant. Um, they can be very well-meaning and yet inactive. So 
there's a lot of, I mean, I landed on unaware, but there were many things I wanted to call this phase because there's so many reasons for us to be sitting on the sidelines. Um, we weren't exposed. We don't believe it's true because it's not our experience and we can't kind of take our own blinders off and, and our own lenses off, which are very powerful, or we're not willing to see, or we're, we're disagreeing with somebody else's lived experience. Um, it can be a lot, I feel threatened, I feel attacked, can be also be unaware. So uh, I, I know you all know, there's probably a bunch of folks sitting here and I think my goal in, in creating this is just to name it, you know, to say like, I think at this, if you're coaching a leader that's here on DEI topics, I would say, you know, identify the point of resistance. Ident because it's very different. If you have somebody who's arguing, maybe they just need to understand the data. Maybe they need to hear a different story and, and have some, you know, be, a, feel the empathy awakened. Maybe they need a logical argument. Maybe, um, Maybe the differences and the resistances around, you know, you know, religious beliefs and values, and then the, then it can be a conversation about, well, this is what the company's expecting of leaders. So, you know, your beliefs, values, practices can be over here, but you know, and we can get into this in the Q and A, uh, Jeff and I. But anyway, I think it's so important to address, like, your strategy needs to come from that place of where's the resistance coming from. Um, if somebody feels threatened and their psychological safety feels uncertain because of DEI, that's another piece where perhaps, you know, that can be some conversations and some work around that zero sum thinking, right? If I extend something to others, it means less for me. You know, you could go in that and explore that a bit. So important to understand why and where it's coming from. So then what we want to do is move from unaware to aware, of course, which is the second phase, which is the awakening to, oh, okay, now I'm beginning to see, you know, diversity is more than race and gender. Or I have a diversity story, or this touches my life in this way, or I have these biases because of how I grew up, or um, here's something I'm covering and it's under the waterline. And here's something I never articulate or speak because it's so risky and stigmatized. Um, these, this can be that journey into the self and it's private. It's usually maybe done with the coach, right? Um, that it is the discovery of how, how does this matter to me? And this could be what's in it for me too. It could be, wow, I, I really need to kind of do this as a leader because clearly I'm managing teams that, that don't share a lot of the identities that I carry. And so there's going to be so much that I don't know, so much that I need to go read about or learn about or listen to podcasts about or go watch, watch more, consume more media so that I broaden my understanding about these things that I don't know anything about, whether that's what does LGBTQ plus stand for or what is neurodiversity or, um, you know, how, how do I spot mental health issues and, and, and cope with them in the workplace? You know, there's so, how, how would I um, have a handle uh, somebody's pronouns and offering different pronouns, you know, on a day at work? And, and would I be ready for that? So this is an exploration phase in aware, it's an awakening. And, and this can be overwhelming because a lot has been um, surfaced in the last two years. A lot of truth, a lot of stories, a lot of data, a lot of hard stuff that I think for some of us has been surprising and new to learn. So meeting people where they're at means naming the, the potential overwhelm and helping leaders and ourselves kind of parse through and create some priorities and, and perhaps an action plan. So, but we can't sit in, in aware because aware is that, that self-exploration. But to me, what's really going to shift systems is our actions. And so phase three is active, which is, okay, now I'm ready to put, put my study into action. I'm beginning to use new language. I'm beginning to share about my iceberg, what's under my waterline, um, my covering experiences, um, what I'm learning about my biases. I'm willing to begin conversations with others about this and, and dive into as, as scary and uncertain as it might feel into a, a deeper conversation and not knowing where that's gonna go. And also not, and knowing that I'm not going to show up uh, perfectly because that's not even a, a tenable goal. Um, I like to say for active, you know, don't make perfect the enemy of the good. I think we have a very perfectionistic work culture. And again, that's one of those norms, right? Where there's no room for 
learning or getting it not quite right, or, you know, I don't love the word wrong. Um, but I do wish for organizations and for leaders that there were, there were room to experiment, room to get feedback, room to adjust, room to be resilient and then come back and try something new. So, um, I, I can't promise, obviously, sitting here that that leaders are, the hard part about leadership is they are having to grow in public. But as, as you move into active, you are putting yourself out there more publicly and you are a learner and you're admitting, I don't know what I don't know. Here's what I do know. Here's what I'm learning. Here's what I'm committing to. Here's what I want to hear how I'm doing on. Um, this is a very iterative stage. Um, and I, I just, my prayer is that people have enough room and space and grace from others and with themselves to grow and progress as they get their feet under them. And the final phase then is advocate, which I think of as a very aspirational stage, um, but it is the squeaky wheel. It's, this, it's somebody who has spent time in all of these phases and has mastery, right? I know what to say, when to say, how to push, I know how to get un uncomfortable being uncomfortable, and I know how to create enough discomfort in others so that it, it creates change. Um, but this can be a very exhausting place to live. Some of you may really feel you're an advocate um, every single day, you know, and it may be very personal to you. You know, you may have um, your own diversity story and, and sort of journey, as I've described mine. You may have a, a kid with a disability and you are their huge advocate and ally. Um, you may be you may be agitating all the time in whatever you know uh, communities of practice you're in, um, but I think this is this burnout is high for this uh, phase, and we can also be advocates on one sense and then very much early stage learners in another. So for me, I may be advocate level because I have a deep knowledge of certain identities because those are my lived experience or the lived experience of those that I am close to. But then there's others where I would put myself in aware and just you know making efforts to move into active on a regular basis. That's my own homework. So you can be many places. And, and the next slide, I'll just wrap up with you know showing you the whole model from left to right and, and sort of noticing at the macro level this, you know, we can be multiple places and that we move on the bottom. I have private to public, you know, we move. Uh, forward in that way. Um, and we take on a little more risk because absolutely anytime we're changing in public, like leaders are expected to do, and they're expected to do it like yesterday, um, the risk does go up. But I would, I would sort of caveat risk because when you are perhaps you benefit from a system because the system works for you, I don't know if the risk is the same risk as, for example, uh, some, a trans person transitioning at work or coming and going from work or being in the world. That is risk, you know, that is, that is, I would argue a different kind of risk. So, you know, when our leaders are like, I'm scared, I don't wanna do this, it's too risky, I can't, um, you know, it's this, you know, whatever, whatever it is, I, I would encourage like an honest conversation about risk. Like let's actually like nail that down and say like, well, actually like, let's start slow. Let's, you know, begin to build this muscle because it is a muscle. And you know, let's let's come back and calibrate and adjust and 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 take it one step at a time. And yes, mitigate risk absolutely. But the way you mitigate risk is that you do you're doing your homework and you're following your own growth journey and your own evolution. That has been my my experience of it. So, thank you. I that's mainly what I brought for us today. And Jeff, um, I'm looking forward to Q and A. I haven't even looked at chat or questions yet. But everybody, um, if you want to be a part of our world, we have an assessment at the bottom of the, um, the slide here, Inclusive Leader Assessment, and you can use that code, but um, it's a wonderful 10 minute free assessment. Um, please check out the book, check out the podcast, absolutely. And, and um, you know, we'd love to have you as part of our community. More coaches we can have, the better. We already have a bunch, but um, you know, I'd love to have you in our world and, and interacting with some of these concepts and telling me and us, like, how are you, how are they proving helpful to you in your, in your guidance of the leaders that we care so much about and also in your own self-leadership? All right, with that, Jeff, I'll uh, come back over to you. Great, well, thank you so much. It was so awesome for you to walk us through that. I loved the clarity and um, I can see people popping into the Q&A very quickly. So 
I want to try to get to as many of those questions as we can. Mm, yes. um, but I'm going to start by taking the privilege, speaking of privilege. <laughs> speaking of privilege. Because there you go, right? It shows up you know? in places. It, but yeah, the privilege of being the moderator, I get to ask <laughs> my own question as the first question. Sure. But I'm just, I am curious, um, what is your experience when you go into a group setting, like, in because you work with large organizations, mm. And I'm sure a lot of coaches would love to hear a little bit about what it's like to take this model into a bank or, you know, an airline or whatever, you know, a pharmaceutical company, group of leaders. What what happens in that experience? I think, honestly, people are relieved. I mean, first okay. of all, the fact that I even address the puzzle pieces, including my privilege, like right from the beginning, and I talk about I, I'm comfortable. I try to role model like what it sounds like to normalize, or I like the word usualize better, what it looks like for someone that looks like me to usualize the talking about these things, right? And, and, and so I set the tone quickly. I'm vulnerable from the start. And then to give a model that's not about, oh, you're, a, I thought she was going to tell me I'm a bad person today. I thought I was going yeah. to feel bad again about yeah we're going to do diversity are, training and that's yeah. going to make you feel bad right i mean and people don't learn from a place of shame i mean i i always yeah. go back to Brene brown's like guilt versus shame it's so helpful shame is i'm a bad person guilt is i did a bad thing or i regret something i did or didn't do right guilt there's learning in guilt it's it's a it's more I, i'm not going to argue whether they're all helpful or not but for purposes of this I think regret and wishing that I'd done something, said something, learned something, known something, those are great emotions. They're very motivational. And so, um, and, but I don't even go there even. <laughs> like, I think, I think the problem with how we've taught all of this is we've, we've started from like the 3.0, like, you know, mm. senior thesis of anti-racism. <laughs> Or we started right. with, I often come in and maybe they will have read, um, which is a wonderful book, you know, White Fragility. And maybe they will have discussed that and it will have kicked up a lot of noise in the system. And I guess the challenge we have as a team is coming in after what has already happened. It's sort of the, the crime scene. <laughs> Wait a second, like everything's flying around and I'm trying to, we're trying to sort of get grounded in like what is and, and what can we work with? Like, what can we hold on to here? Like what is already going well? Where are people already making efforts? So I think to give people a diagnostic that is kind of objective in its way and let right. them self-assess, like, where do I think I am? Hmm. So I know a lot about that. And I would say I'm active on maybe race and ethnicity, because, you know, I've really, really paid attention to that this last year or two. And here's some things that I've done, but then I'm really sort of way behind. And then the early stages, no judgments around disabilities, for example, because yeah. it's not in my life in a primary way. And I, as a manager, as a leader, I haven't been sort of confronted with um, accommodations, for example, or I, I don't, um, it just, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, so we can, we can just frankly together, I think, look at where we are and then we can, we can help. That's where it gets so interesting because we're all kind of complementary to each other. Like Jeff, you'll know about certain things that I won't know about. And um, mm -hmm. each, each person, we have so much to teach each other. If we can create enough psychological safety and then I, I turn them loose to talk to each other. And invariably people are dying to talk about this. I know it's surprising, but even in banks, I will promise you, when I set this first kind of 20 minutes up that you just saw, and then I let them loose, there is a catharsis because mm. I think we've, so many people have thought this doesn't, how do I get in? Like, how do right. I, how do I relate? Like, what do I have in me that has anything to do with this? And for some reason, for whosoever fault it is, it doesn't matter. It's, it's saying, no, you are, you're in this. You, it's like for men who always were like, well, gender is a women's issue. I love like <laughs> the reframing to say gender, we all have a gender. <laughs> right. We all have a gender identity right. and, and there are gender dynamics. Like men have an experience of their gender, as I was referring to earlier, which may involve some toxic masculinity and the pressure right. to conform that is deeply, deeply wounding and traumatic. So 
let's make space for a full and honest and holistic conversation because I think then that will establish trust and openness and and put us all, you know, not on equal footing because this is not, you know, this is not like, oh, your trauma is better or worse than mine or, you know, therefore I can't like, well, I've had, yes, I've had a very privileged life. Okay, fine. Then let's work from that. But let's work from where people are and build on what we have to work with. Yeah, that's great. No, I think that, yeah, you're not coming in with a, with a solution that you're putting over or on people. You're actually bringing them a, a conversation and a dialogue for them to explore where they are. So that's actually, uh, even though it can be scary, it's also going to be an, more of an invitation. Yeah. Which I love. Good energy. I want to ask you right right from the start, Roberto had a wonderful question literally right at the very beginning. So how do we work with ourselves to be aware and become more inclusive individual coach and leader? So basically, how do we how do we do our own work? What do you say to that? Work. Yeah. So well, I'll I'll share the work I try to do is I I I evaluate the the people in my networks, my friends, my community, my you know, my go-to people, like. I, I constantly am challenging myself to, and this takes work because we live in bubbles. Like if, if we're not proactively pushing, we will end up in a homogenous place, whether that's, you know, in social media or whatever. So I would evaluate that and make strides to not just read books about different lived experiences and surround yourself with that information, which is also super powerful stories, Ted talks, um, points of view, authors, thought leaders, you know, research, you know, I, I would really encourage all of you to, you've got to make time every week to enrich and deepen your understanding of about, I might say, if I could pick a number, 12 different diversity dimensions, you know, it's, <laughs> and it's you know, and I know that's a lot, but if right. you make, what if you did a month per one? Like, what if you said, I spent 10 hours listening in on a webinar about the black experience, about misogynoir, which is specific to black women and the stigma that black women feel. Misogynoir, interesting word. Um, intersectional, right. female, black, right? Yeah. Um, um, I'm gonna spend a month on LGBTQ and learning everything I can about gender identity and non-binary identity, whatever. Um, you will progress. And you will deepen. And as a coach, then you can be on the lookout in your clients for, okay, so where have they not done the work yet? Like I would even compare resource lists. I would even make this your work available to them because chances are your coachee is on a journey and maybe behind where you are is what I would guess. I don't know. But so you're in a way, you know, sharing your work and how you are becoming and you are evolving and what you're coming to understand. And, and to a degree, you can create a safe space for somebody to say, oh, thank you for that. Oh, I listened to that. Oh, I watched that. Oh, could we discuss that? What did you think? What did you learn? What were you surprised by? Unpacking things together in a safe space is exactly what these leaders need. And right. honestly, what they can't do with anybody else. Like this is the tragic thing. I just don't, I mean, I've been the consultant whose job it is to learn about this stuff, but leaders have to be running their business and they have to be super humble to being like at the beginning of a learning process about this whole new language that feels completely foreign. Right. So it's a scary, it's a scary place. And um, it's a, it's a lot of catch up. It's a very steep learning curve. And I have a lot of compassion for that. So so if you can bring any of that to the surface and say, hey, I know as a leader, you're being expected to show up with a competency around this. And you may not feel that you have a competency or you're, or you're, you have sort of holes everywhere in your competency. You know this and you don't know that. <laughs> which we all do. <laughs> which we all do. So just right. naming that and, and going through an inventory of sorts. Um, there's one in the book, actually. It's the inner circle inventory. And it asks people to go through their immediate networks and sort of identify who's missing. I, I do believe knowing a human of that identity and having the trusted conversations with them is is better than any book. But yeah, having a real life right? experience, and, right? No, so I would I would I would pay attention to both the human and also the sort of the digital, but both of those things. And then I would That's ask great. the leader to create a learning plan for themselves and 
hold them, you know, help them hold themselves accountable for it. And ask so, ourselves to do that for ourselves too, exactly, right? Exactly. Super. Exactly. I love what you said about being super humble. I think that to me, that is sort of the core yeah. of just recognizing that you don't know what you don't know. So, yeah. Help your leader, a, like talk of, about that too. Ta like right. be open about, this is super scary to say as a leader who's been paid and rewarded and promoted to say, by the way, like I'm a learner about this and he, and here's what I know and here's what I don't know. And that's very counterintuitive. So you're going to need to hold some hands, I think, through getting comfortable being uncomfortable. But you can role model that vulnerability by actually owning that you don't know everything. That's right. Yourself. That's right. A couple of specific questions about the first part of your assessment, I think would be good for you to go back to. Um, I just have to find it. Michael was asking, what is the difference in your mind between being unaware and being resistant? Oh, there's a big difference. And how do you approach them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I because then it, another person is asking sort of a similar question. Resistance occurs when people encounter, in, encounter threat and anxiety. Right. And so I think, you know, they're asking, it's one thing to, to sort of be blank mm -hmm. and it's another to sort of be <laughs> dismissive or push it away or so how do you make those distinctions and, and approach those different energies? Yeah. Intent, like where they're coming from, the intent is so, uh, you have to sort of peel the onion, right? And get underneath also, because it may present as something, it may present as resistance or disagreement when really it's a lack of understanding or, fear. or it may, or it may present as apathy, but it may be resistance and values and beliefs. Like, I don't know, like a religious belief, like belief right? And so, you know, unpacking all of that together with someone, I think, I think it really, we've got us, I don't know, I wish I had a magic way to advise you all quickly to be able to do that. Um, I would imagine as you sort of pull the thread with a leader, you know, you can get back to, you know, how they were raised, the messages that they heard. Maybe there's a mistaken belief that one plus one plus one can't equal three, like that this is an abundance versus a scarcity play. Right. <laughs> and, and your leaders might even be wrestling with like my way of life, right? My, um, my generation is. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would just suggest, and, powerful. and you and I have talked about this, but I think, I think one of the things that we can do as coaches is name discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. It's a paradox, but we, and somewhat counterintuitive, but when you have a strong relationship with your client, and even in a group, if you feel that there's enough psychological safety, you can, as a coach, name that this, this topic some, feels to me like it's discomforting for you. Yeah. Tell me more. Yes, exactly. Tell me and then, more. And then also confiding and saying, I've, here's where I've been uncomfortable. I think we, right. we right. make it, that, to your point, role modeling how to speak about it. Right. Create some safety for people to speak about it, particularly in that safe coaching relationship too, I hope which can be kind of a laboratory incubator for right. somebody's ev evolution. Um, I think yeah. a lot of leaders today are in a position where they also feel that they are expected to know more than they do. Mm, for sure. Yeah. And so that comes across as resistance or anxiety or a little bit of intimidation or fear. Mm. And if you can lower that waterline as a coach by owning your own vulnerability, sometimes it can shift the energy from what would be resistance into exploration or inquiry or curiosity right? curiosity Curiosity's is great yeah. openness right um i also i mean this is a, a bit of a hard-hitting cynical view but sometimes self-preservation is a really interesting <laughs> argument you know i i think leaders need to change leadership is uncomfortable it always has yeah. been right and now more than ever even if you're senior you can't coast you cannot, I love uh, Marshall Goldsmith, what got you here won't get you there. Powerful. Like if anything, we need to change even more, the, right. like the more senior we get, because the world, the acceleration of change has been so dramatic and we risk being left behind. We risk irrelevance if we can't kind of take who we know we are and what our strengths are and mold, be molded by this moment, be shaped by 
this moment. So the more time we spend in resistance, the less time we have to be, be shaped, to allow ourselves to say, well, well, if this is now I'm hearing, it's very important to the younger generations of talent. For example, I hear that my organization wants me to be more competent and more, um, more, more of a voice. You know, the time we spend in resistance is while important is sort of, you know, you know, whistling while the house is on fire. <laughs> can we, can we engage and spend this time instead kind of um, building the scaffolding around us as this new leader that's going to enter this next decade powerfully, you know, that is going to right. be able to pivot and be able to be flexible and agile and responsive and, 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 and with work and working this muscle, learn how to resonate with the moment, like meet the moment. Leaders, leaders don't even just meet the moment. We have to anticipate the moment. Right. So if we spend, just remember, like with the leader, if you're, we're spending all this time kind of arguing and is it true? And I don't agree. And it's not what I don't see, whatever. I, it's, it's fine, but like, we got to get to the business at hand, which is also that we want somebody to be able to pivot and continue to be an effective leader, but we're only effective if we have followership. We're only effective if we can build trust across difference. That's the only way we're going to get things done. So right. to me, this is the recipe for that. Yeah. And I think it's, it's great because you're actually answering. There's a few other questions here and we're going to unfortunately run out of time, but the you know, Colleen is asking, is it how, when is it appropriate for a coach to raise the issues around DEI if that's not on the agenda, right, of the mm. client or not on the agenda and you're coming in as the coach? But I think you're kind of speaking to that, that whatever the agenda is, if the person is trying to develop themselves as a leader, then how can DEI be left out of the mix, right? Yeah. How would and you bring that, how would you bring that in? That's right. No, you're right, Jeff. Um, I challenge myself sometimes if I know there's a lot of baggage around DEI, I just try to not use those words. And I try mm. to just talk about leadership and evolution and building trust. Like it's hard to disagree with the importance, growing importance of leading and, and influencing people across difference. And those differences can look at the iceberg, right? There's a million entry points to say right. that isn't going to hopefully cause somebody to go in their corner. But, but is actually going to be extremely relevant to their ability to do their job well. Um, so I think you have to also just be aware that there, this comes sort of like a Mack truck. <laughs> and you know, somebody may have a lot of preconceived notions, um, but I, I think if you're, if you're a coach worth your salt, you shouldn't wait for the organization to be pressuring the leader to be better. I, I do think you as a coach, this will be at somebody's doorstep sooner or later if it's not already. And I do think coaching leaders and looking at the leadership competency set, inclusiveness and an attention to belonging and, an, and a little bit of an understanding of what fuels that, what, what gets in the way of psychological safety, what role does bias have and how people do their best work or not. Um, you, to be a good leader is to be an inclusive leader. So whether or not it helps you as a coach, if the, if the organization is instituting, right, and supporting this, but in the meantime, you could say you can begin to have those conversations, I think. Um, right. But how you couch them is important to, I think, minimize the baggage piece and, um, you know, talk about the, the, those sort of true and universal challenges of, 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 you know, like we've been talking about a sort of, um, you know, we're all and use the iceberg use if you want the inclusive leader. Continuum. I was going to say, it's like, yeah. yes, use use the iceberg because there's so many places mm. to access That's right. diversity is so much richer and we are really all just beginning to learn you know sort of the level of multiplicity that goes on underneath around our identities yeah. so whatever access route helps people raise that water line mm. is really key yeah, anyway, else. yeah, oh, so yeah much we have to wrap. So yeah. I want to thank you so much, Jennifer. Oh, this, this is so, so great. Thank Wonderful you, way to kick off the year. Uh, and I hope everyone will get a copy of your book. And I hope we will see you again very, very soon. So, so thank you all for joining us. And um, we'll see you soon. We have, uh, I guess, I think there's another webinar coming your way in a couple of weeks. So look on our website. Um, but we will definitely be with you again, Jennifer, and we wish you all the best I for a great so. year ahead. Thanks, everybody, for the work you do in the world. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye now.